Hello, and on behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar on livestock and climate smart agriculture innovations. My name is Kate Flanley, and I am an international research advisor with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I will serve as co-moderator along with my wonderful RFS colleague, Aaron menzies floor And in the background is Mira Chandra helping with the Q&A session. Before we begin, let's get you oriented to the Blue Jeans platform. On the right side of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. So first, please use the chat to introduce yourselves to our colleagues around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. And please indicate um, who the question is for, and you can also upvote uh, the questions you would like answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar, but the Q&A session will occur at the end of the presentations. If the presentation is too small on your screen, please use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. And lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You will also find resources on agrilinks.org once they are ready. USAID is committed to strengthening sustainable livestock production in a way that meets development objectives and mitigates climate impacts. As the effects of climate change intensify, Feed the Future partners are answering the call through the research development and scaling of climate smart agriculture innovations and best practices. Our agenda today includes opening remarks from Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist at USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And then we will hear from each of our panelists who will share their country-based experiences working at the nexus of livestock and climate change. This will be followed by a question and answer session. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Rob. Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, I think really important topic, uh, very timely topic to talk about livestock and climate smart agriculture. Just want to thank uh, Kate and Aaron and uh, Mira for all the uh, work they put into lining up a great set of speakers. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes with you to share some thoughts from my perspective. I always start to think that anything that's uh, part of the problem must always be part of the solution as well. So I think before we dive into climate, let's do a little bit of a reality check on the role of livestock and really you could argue animal source foods more broadly. But the livestock sector accounts for about 40% of agricultural GDP in most countries where we work. And sometimes that can go up to 60%, for example, in the Sudan. And the other, I think, very important thing to keep in view is that it's almost all smallholder uh, uh, pr pr production and productivity. And so livelihoods of countless millions of people depend on the animal agriculture sector. I think a second thing that we need to think about when we think about anything to do with animal source, animal foods is talk about nutrition. I'm always remembering that Lindsay, um, uh, oh, my colleague at UC Davis, I, Lindsay Allen, sorry, uh, a great nutritionist, told me and showed me the data years ago that if you don't get 15% of your uh, calories in your diet from animal source foods, you're likely to be B12 deficient. And that's just one example. We also know the, the Luna study from Ecuador where children at high risk of stunting just by including an egg a day, uh, these were very young children, uh, as a, you know, after six months, after starting to have uh, complementary foods, that alone lowered stunting by half, just an egg a day, without changing anything else in terms of sanitation or water or healthcare. So just the importance of quality foods in the diet cannot be underestimated. And quality diet ma diets matter, and we know that only about 18% of children in the developing world are getting really high quality diets. So we can't take, uh, we have to keep that in view. Third is the environment. And often, of course, livestock is painted as a villain in the environment, but that it doesn't have to be the case at all. And in many, many contexts, that's far from being true. It's part of a nutrient cycling in agricultural systems, the, the important role of manure and other wastes 
um, as, as, to crop productivity and, and, and overall system sustainability and productivity. So, you know, in, in our work in USAID, we're not talking about cattle ranching in the tropical Americas. We're talking about uh, smallholder dominated systems that pervade all the countries practically, uh, I would say, that we work in. Now, coming to climate, I'm always remembering that Bruce Campbell, the head of the uh, CGIAR's Climate Change and Agricultural and Food Security Program, CCAFS, many of you have heard of it, said years ago that anything we do to increase animal productivity in sub-Saharan Africa is climate smart. Now, why did he say that? Because emissions intensity is so high now, we know that dairy cattle in Africa, for example, are far less efficient than their counterparts in South Asia and order of magnitude less efficient than what we run, run into or several orders, well, not several, but orders of a high, high multiplier compared to what a cow in uh, uh, Europe or North America would generate in terms of emissions per quantity of milk produced. So that's just one example. So it's really about bending the curve and, and doing it in ways that, uh, that provide affordable quality diets, that, that steward our environmental resources, and, and that uh, make uh, nutrition within reach and provide good livelihoods. So finally, coming to food systems. We're in a food systems environment, but let's keep in mind that it wasn't hunger and extreme poverty that drove the global conversation on food systems. Rather, it was issues around climate change and the environment and uh, chronic health problems associated with negative dietary transitions, especially in developed countries. So we have to keep, those are very important issues, but we need to always think about global challenges but then local contexts. And that's what our speakers today are going to be helping us understand why, uh, why we can do so much better than we're doing in ways that will uh, make uh, animal agriculture much cl more climate smart, as Bruce Campbell said, uh, while we're also achieving our goals around the environment, around incomes for the poor, especially, and for affordable quality diets for everyone, especially low-income people. So I think uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers for you this morning. AgriLinks always does such a great job of, of hosting us. So I'm delighted now to uh, turn it back to our moderators. And uh, uh, Kate, uh, thanks a lot for have, giving me time to share some thoughts. Thank you so much, Rob, for your insightful introduction to today's topics. We're just thrilled to have you here. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Our first speaker is Bola Adishigan, uh, who is the director for the, Inter uh, for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems. Our second speaker, Polly Erickson, is program leader for the Sustainable Livestock Program at the International Livestock Research Institute. And our third speaker, Sophia Condes is the Investor Outreach Manager for the Fair Animal Investment Risk and Return Initiative. And so we're thrilled to hear these presentations and we will now turn it over to Bola. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I'm very grateful to Kate and Erin uh, for the invitation to present today. And special thanks to Rob Bertram for such a nice uh, introduction. He set the scene really nicely. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do in the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems um, that aims at climate, human, and livestock wins. So the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems works in nine countries, seven African countries, and two Asian countries. And our vision is to sustainably intensify livestock production in order to meet the nutritional needs, to improve the income, the health, and the livelihoods of the vulnerable. Uh, first, next slide, please. Okay, Rob talked about the importance of animal source foods um, for proper nutrition, and that's a point that can't be overstated. 
Uh, the World Food Programme uh, describes animal source foods as the best nutrient source for children aged 6 to 23 months old. And UNICEF says that about 60% of children don't get enough of these vital nutrients. And I've just listed a few of them here. And what I'm trying to present here is how they compare to plant sources of these nutrients. And you find that by and large, the animal sources are much more bioavailable. Um, and some of them like B12 that um, Rob mentioned, animal sources are the only dietary source. Um, so you get a combination of superior quality protein, higher quantity in many cases, in most cases, higher energy density, higher nutrient density, and better nutrient bioavailability. Why is this important? Because taunting is perhaps the greatest challenge facing children in the developing world. And this problem condemns children to a lifetime of underperformance and underachievement. And in addition to wash factors, you know, poor nutrition, undernutrition is the primary cause. These animal source foods can help prevent this terrible problem, which constrains school achievement, uh, limits uh, adult earning potential, and even the gross domestic product of nations. Next slide, please. Now, having said that about the importance of livestock products for nutrition, it is true that livestock contributes significantly to global greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, the estimate is about 14.5%, which is significant. And so many of us in the livestock sector have been working on strategies to mitigate these emissions. It's also noteworthy that a significant portion of the emissions associated with livestock production are based on enteric fermentation or you know, breaking down the food in the digestive system and actual feed provision to the animals. So collectively, these account for about 85%, which is a major, major source of these greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. Now, as we heard from Rob, um, livestock often have a negative press. And it is true, like I mentioned earlier, that there are significant emissions by livestock. But the story is much more nuanced than you often hear. First of all, if you look at the figure on the left, it shows high levels of total emissions by region and by species. And if you look at that picture, you will go away thinking that, well, the, the developed countries are the main polluters in terms of total emissions. But if you look at the, the, the phrase um, Rob mentioned, the emissions intensity, that is how much greenhouse gas emissions are produced per unit of meat or milk or eggs or fish, in that case, then you have a different picture. That's the graphic we have on the right. And in that case, it's the developing countries in Africa and South Asia and so on that are emitting a lot more. And this is because the livestock production systems in these regions are less, much less efficient and productive. So per unit of animal product or per unit of food supply, then you get far more emissions. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that is un unfortunately uh, a well-kept secret in many areas is that there are several strategies that can be used to mitigate livestock emissions. And this uh, graph here from FAO just shows um, some data from 2018 showing that for all species of livestock, significant reductions in emissions can be achieved, um, ranging from 17 to about 40%. And in the last two years, there have been studies that have shown that even up to 85, 90% of emissions from cattle can be mitigated with certain dietary additives. And we can discuss those um, during the question and answer session. So there are solutions in place. And some of these are already being adopted and used in the West. And we're working on introducing some of these to our focal countries. Next slide, please. I think another thing that's important to bear in mind when we hear about the negative press uh, for livestock is that many times we don't, um, we don't uh, assess 
the relative emissions from livestock based on what livestock are really supplying, and that is these vital nutrients. So there's this very nice paper by Ty Beal, which shows very, uh, you know, in a compelling manner that when we look at the environmental impact, imp impacts, the greenhouse gas footprint um, of different types of food based on the nutrient density, then you have a very different picture than what we typically see. Because what you find is that the livestock products actually produce less emissions relative to um, the whole grains and, and in particular the refined grains. So it's very important to value this nutrient density, this nutrient contribution from livestock products. Next slide, please. One of the things that Rob mentioned is that in Africa and perhaps in South Asia, anything done to improve livestock production is climate smart. And I believe in that 100%. This is some data from Kenya showing the impacts on greenhouse gas reduction and milk production of a number of different interventions. Why is it that anything done for improving livestock production is climate smart? Well, those emissions of methane and so on and nitrous oxide, they represent energy losses and losses of important nutrients which can be otherwise diverted into performance, into growth, into milk production. So supplementation with concentrates, you can see it's win there for milk production and for reducing emissions. Incorporating legumes uh, in animal diets, uh, conserving different feeds as silage, deworming, controlling disease, artificial insemination, all these are just some of the different strategies that can be deployed to reduce emissions and to improve performance. So for the rest of this presentation, I will tell you about some of the specific, just three of the specific things that we have been doing in the Livestock Lab. Next slide, please. So we have about 50 technologies that we have developed in our first phase, and um, we will only be talking about three of them. One of the things that we're doing is trying to accurately measure the greenhouse gas emissions of African livestock. And so we have projects in both Burkina Faso and Ethiopia where we are directly quantifying the emissions using state-of-the-art equipment that um, we brought into the countries. We're working closely with our partners um, in the research, uh, the, the national agricultural research uh, um, agencies, as well as with our partners in ILRI um, to deploy strategies to quantify these emissions because a lot of what has been reported in the past is estimates that are not based on direct measurements, and many of those are to varying extents misleading. So this will help us generate among the first accurate data on livestock emissions, and will help us to formulate diet, diets that are balanced in terms of nutrient supply, they match the nutrient needs of animals, but they are climate smart, because these strategies we use can also measure the emissions when we're formulating diets and of course, reducing the affordability or improving affordability by looking at least cost rations. Next slide, please. Another thing that we've been working on in several of our countries is introducing um, high quality, high yield, climate resilient forages. So in the picture that you've seen here, this is one of our pro colleagues from uh, EIAR in Ethiopia, um, Dr. Akilu, working with new sorghum genotypes, higher yielding, higher quality, and drought tolerant. And we have gone ahead to feed some of these to animals to demonstrate improved productivity. We have done willingness to pay studies in Burkina Faso, showing farmers are indeed willing to pay for these new introduced forages. And um, this is really important in terms of climate adaptation. So we are all witnesses to the longer dry seasons, the more frequent droughts caused by climate change, um, so that even the, the traditional varieties are not producing as well. So these drought tolerant, high quality, or even higher quality, higher yield forage genotypes are really vital for ensuring year round proper and positive livestock production. Next slide, please. The last thing I will mention is our ration formulation effort. 
And I think this is critical across um, most of Africa, um, many parts of South Asia. And we have been working to develop um, ration formulation apps or software that formulate balanced diets that exactly match the nutrient needs of animals. This avoids a lot of, a lot of waste of feeds and that wastage itself contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, but also helps us to reduce emissions from the animals themselves. What you see here is a picture um, from a ration formulation app we rolled out in Nepal. Uh, I'm actually in Burkina Faso this week and with our colleagues at UC Davis, we just completed a training of different people from the government, from academia and so on, a ration formulation app for um, small ruminants. So why is this important? Because it helps us to optimize the performance of the animals. Um, so in Nepal, we saw that 94% of farmers who tried the app improved milk production by an average of 14%. So this allows us to provide much needed balanced rations that optimize productivity, reduce waste, and reduce emissions. Last slide, please. So some of the next steps for us are that we will be um, funding 15 new projects that are using climate smart approaches to try and tackle demand-led, highly prioritized needs in the focal countries. And these are geared to improve livestock production, to improve the affordability, accessibility, and the safety of animal source foods. So we're really excited at many of those who have applied for funds from us, and they will be starting this new work in the new year. Uh, in our first phase, we our capacity development uh, team identified individual and institutional capacity development needs in all our focal countries. And in this next five years, we'll be working to address those gaps in close partnership with our colleagues in our focal countries. We are keenly looking for um, collaboration for partners, particularly from the private sector, to help us in a number of ways. First of all, we developed about 50 climate smart innovative technologies in our first phase, and we're keen to scale these. So we're looking for people who will work with us to scale these and um, maybe one of my team members one of my colleagues can paste in the chat a link to some of our innovative technologies secondly we need policy change or policy implementation to ensure that conducive environments for growth of the livestock sector and for um, uh, consumption of animal source foods are present in our focal countries so we're looking for partners in that area as well. And we continue to seek research collaborators to help us increase the scope and impacts of our activities. Um, we are, for instance, working with the Africa Development Bank that has a goal to double agricultural productivity in Africa. And we've proposed certain initiatives to them. And we're looking for additional collaborators um, from different sectors to join us in this important work. The final point I have there is we're broadening our scope beyond livestock. Livestock are extremely important nutrient-dense foods, but there are others um, like vegetables, fruits, nuts, seafood, and so on that we are now working on because our livestock lab is part of a food system institute that focuses on all nutrient-dense foods and has a local to global focus. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I will pass it on to Polly Erickson from Ilri, who will um, speak next. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm based in Nairobi, so it's evening for me. Good morning um, and good afternoon to, to the rest of you. Um, so thanks very much uh, to um, the colleagues from AgriLinks uh, and USAID for giving me a chance. Um, so I'm really going to build on from uh, what um, Bola was talking about, and I'm going to talk about how the livestock and climate change um, research agenda has evolved um, in the network of organizations that I that I work for, um, the one CGIAR. So I um, I am employed by the International Livestock Research Institute, but as some of you may know, the CGIAR is undergoing um, a transformation um, into a one CGIAR structure. 
um, and uh, um, uh, that's um, yeah. So that's reflected in um, in some of the in some of the new um, the new initiatives that that we have. Um, so um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I've been working um, at ILRI uh, since 2010. Um, and um, I, I, I joined and I, I became part of a, of, a, of a group of researchers that was working on um, both uh, climate change and, and livestock production, but also had a, had a real commitment to looking at um, how uh, livestock producers um, in, in extensive dryland, dryland systems um, also manage, manage, their, um, manage their livestock um, <coughs> and, and particularly were adapted to climate risk. And so it struck me when I, when I joined Ilry and I'd already been working on environmental change in agriculture for over a decade was that because of the advent of livestock's long shadow um, in 2006, Ilry really was focused on, um, on the agenda for demonstrating um, that we could reduce um, the greenhouse gas emissions intensities from the smallholder livestock systems that both Rob and Bola so nicely um, uh, referred to. Um, and so it, it is true. I mean, Bola's already been through the statistics with you. Um, we tend to focus on the emissions from livestock and agricultural systems. But, you know, to add to the data that Bola shared with you, 65 percent of agricultural emissions are, re are related to livestock. And so, yes, we as the as the livestock for um, research and development community had to acknowledge um, that emissions from livestock are, are a global concern. Um, and so um, but but but. That, that sort of challenge call um, that, that, came, that came from FAO and others um, um, prompted um, um, a, a research agenda that we spent about a decade and we're still working on. Um, so the, the first part of that agenda was to acknowledge um, that livestock production systems in the global south are not the same as those um, in, in the global north or, or in Australia. Um, there's much less data about those systems they're small scale and they're highly heterogeneous. So I would say for the first five to six years um, that, 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 that Ilri and others in the, in the livestock and climate change community were, were working on this, we focused on getting better numbers for smallholder systems in the global south. And so we did this by working with the, with the models and trying to give them better data, better estimates about perhaps for example, what livestock are fed, how livestock move around, how much weight livestock gain or don't gain, um, really understanding um, the huge variety, not just in production systems, but also in quality and quantity of those feed baskets. We then, and this is an agenda that we're still very much engaged in, developed a laboratory um, here um, on, on, in, our, in our Nairobi campus where we want to fix those estimates with actual empirical data. So for the last six years, um, we've been working to do field-based and laboratory-based measurements um, to refine the activity data, which are so important to helping countries um, measure, uh, report, and, um, and verify the emissions from their livestock systems, but also actually to understand the actual emissions um, from livestock systems. Uh, this has largely been based in East Africa. We're also now doing some work in West Africa. But just it's really important for countries um, and, 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 uh, in Africa and, and smallholder systems elsewhere in the Americas and South Asia to have actual data because they can't move to Tier 2 without that. And if they can't move to Tier 2, then they are, are completely unable to track their progress in reducing those emissions intensities. And as you know, the ability to track that progress is really important to attracting climate finance. A second agenda, and I would like to acknowledge the support of some of our, of our USAID colleagues through the CCAS program that Rob mentioned, was that we were asked to think about um, the social science side of things. How could we develop, test, and validate these low emissions interventions working with farmers to understand their current practices and the challenges that they face in adopting, in adopting best bet practices. But I do need to say um, that it comes down largely to feed, to feed animals more consistently throughout the season in these rain-fed systems with significant dry periods, and to do what we can, um, particularly to find local solutions to improve um, the quality of that feed basket. Next slide, please. However, we really do need to understand that climate change will have significant effects 
on livestock production. Heat stress is an area where we've made uh, quite a bit of progress in the, in, the, in the last year. We've produced some significant publications and we now have a, of, of, a, of, a, of a good understanding. We've always had an understanding of how heat stress would affect livestock yields, livestock physiology, livestock digestion. But we now have some fairly good empirical estimates, particularly for Africa, of where there will be increases in heat stress days, increases in dangerously high heat levels. And we've been able to do some empirical estimates of what that will do to yields um, and, and hence to livelihoods, incomes, and nutrition. It's not just the direct physiology of livestock that will be affected by changes in heat stress. Forage yields will also be affected as temperatures increase. Heat stress is something that we're, we're able to model. We have good crop, we have, you know, fairly decent predictions. We have crop-based models that translate to feed and forages. What's much harder for us to understand is that as climate variabilities and extremes increase, what will that mean for livestock production systems? We do know that pasture yields will change. Um, and as pastures are already highly variable in terms of their um, temporal uh, and spatial distribution, predicting um, how climate change, uh, changes in variability will affect that pastoral productivity are quite challenging. Even more complex is that disease vectors will change. Um, disease, uh, the livestock diseases um, uh, that affect many smallholder producers are quite climate sensitive and quite ecologically sensitive. So if we get the combination of changes in, in, in ecological drivers and changes in climate drivers, we're going to have a whole new host of, um, of, of disease challenges. And so then a big question is, if these production systems then change in, in response to these climate drivers, what will that mean for livelihoods? Next slide, please. So if I have one take home message for you today, is that it's really time for those of us working in the livestock uh, development and research community to be able to talk about the mitigation co-benefits of livestock. Next slide, please. So I'm really excited to say that over the last year, I've had the fortune to work on developing a new initiative under the umbrella of the one CGIR that is focused on livestock climate and system resilience. It's the first time that within the CGIR, in the more than a decade that I've worked here, that we get the chance to have an initiative just focused on livestock and climate change. So we have five key elements um, in, in this new initiative, each of which is quite important. First is that we want to take a landscape approach to offset the ruminant uh, digestion-based emissions, so looking at land-based approaches to offset emissions, but also understanding that if we want to build the resilience of livestock production to climate stress, we need to look at, at whole landscapes. Secondly, bringing it down to the farm and the household level, we've done quite a bit of research on um, what are, what's the social and economic feasibility, what's the ability of farmers to change their behavior, and we need context-specific solutions, particularly for the smallholder, low-income households that we work with. Third, and this is a hot topic, no pun intended, um, we, want to do, we want to do some research about the successes and the opportunities to bundle climate information with other risk management services. We know that climate information alone is not sufficient for farmers to adapt. A big gap in the livestock sector is evidence that investment, climate uh, finance, other kinds of sustainable investment, that, they're, that the livestock sector is a good case for investment. So we're building that evidence. We're working with investors themselves. And then lastly, we need to continue the work that we do on policy and decision support. We need to continue to raise awareness. We need to offer technical support to um, our partners, both in climate change directorates, but also in, 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 in livestock ministries and departments to help them make the case for um, investing in climate change and livestock. And my last slide, please. So I want to say again that livestock deserve the attention given to crops. Both Rob and Bola have explained to you why livestock are so important, not just for nutrition, but also for livelihoods. So adaptation really is the major concern of many of the government partners that we work with. So we need evidence for the impacts that interventions work and for the investments. Mitigation is still really important, but we need to recognize it as a co-benefit of adaptation practices. And then lastly, the social and economic trade-offs of changing farmer 
uh, and other value chain actor behavior is really key. We need to understand this and we need to create the incentives that will enable them to do this. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the question. So thank you very much, uh, Polly, for that very interesting presentation. So first of all, um, I would like to thank the USAID team for inviting me to present our work today. It, it is a real pleasure to be with you and to follow the fascinating presentations of my fellow panelists. So as mentioned earlier in the introductions, my name is Sofia Condes, and I am an investor outreach manager at the FAIR Initiative. And today I would like to speak to you about the role that investors can play in encouraging animal protein companies to adopt more sustainable practices and address climate risk. Um, next slides, please. So before I speak to you about uh, the FAIR initiative and our approach, I want to start by explaining what is FAIR. Uh, so the FAIR initiative was founded five years ago with the intention of providing insightful data on the risks and opportunities associated with intensive animal farming. Our founder, Jeremy Collar, coming from an investment background, realized that there was an information gap when it came to ESG data related to the food sector and decided to use his philanthropic efforts to build a network to be able to give investors relevant ESG information so that they could use capital in a way that supports the transition towards sustainable food systems. A little bit of context on the sustainable finance industry. When we speak about ESG, we are referring to environmental, social, and governance issues that are relevant for investors when they're looking at buying or selling stakes in companies. And investors are increasingly applying these non-financial factors as part of their analysis process to identify material risks and growth opportunities and guide their investment decisions. So FAIR is a global network of investors that have decided to join the initiative to get access to data on the ESG risks and opportunities associated with the animal protein sector. Um, you have a few of the names here in the slide in front of you, but we have over 300 financial institutions that are members of FAIR, which combined have over 45 trillion of US dollars in assets. So as you can imagine, that number and that amount of capital carries substantial influence. And if that capital is shifted or redirected, it can have enormous impact on a whole sector. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So now diving into the data that drives investor interest uh, in understanding the sector. Investors have been thinking about climate change in a very serious way for at least about 10 years. Initially, a lot of their focus has been on using their influence in the sectors that are uh, most responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, at least more obviously responsible, such as the fossil fuel industry. But now investors are presented with the reality that our food system accounts for nearly a third of emissions, and that unlike the energy sector, it is a much more complex and fragmented sector that needs a combined set of changes to be able to align with a 1.5 degree scenario. Here in the, the graph on the right, what you can see is that the black bar indicates business as usual um, in emissions of the food system, which means that if we continue with business as usual, it is highly likely for emissions only from the food system to lead us to a two degrees of warming. Uh, the other bars show the impact of different strategies to change that business as usual. But the conclusion of this visual is that we cannot speak about climate change without speaking about our food system, and investors are increasingly aware of this. The animal agriculture sector contributes approximately 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emission, is emissions each year, with obviously high-income countries contributing a large share of the production and the consumption of those foods. However, with improved management, this footprint can be reduced. We know that, but what we're failing to explain properly and what investors need to understand is what does improved management look like? What are the risks associated with poor management? Which companies are doing better or worse? So these are the kinds of questions that the financial industry asks and they need hard data to answer them. Next slide, please. 
So now I will switch to the lens of an investor, which will always be looking at risks and opportunities because that is the basic principle of financial markets. What we see today is that the animal agriculture sector is exposed to substantial physical and transition risks due to global warming, but those haven't yet been correctly priced by the markets. This transition and physical risks include things such as increased animal feed cost and declining water supplies, increased cost of, cost of cattle mortality, mortality and veterinary cost, reputational risks, such as, though, I mean, we've seen some of the headlines regarding the forestation scandals, which can have tremendous impact on the value of a company, as well as other regulatory policy and legal risks, which can include things such as a tax on meat. So as an investor, you want to be able to distinguish which companies are better prepared to mitigate and adapt to such risks. You want answer to questions such as which com companies are doing better in their commitment towards transitioning to more sustainable practices that will limit their climate impact. Which companies are on the other side, refusing to diversify and adapt to a warming world? Which companies' financials will be more or less impacted? Before FAIR existed, it was nearly impossible to answer these questions. And that's why that's the kind of information that our research analysts integrate into the company's assessments we develop and provide for investors. Next slide, please. So the first step uh, in a company's transition towards minimizing climate-related risk is to become transparent in reporting it, its exposure to such risks and also reporting their levels of emis emissions. A very obvious question is how can a company reduce its emission if it doesn't even have information on its scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions? So what FAIR does is that we provide data by looking at the largest animal protein companies globally. So here I'm speaking about very big companies uh, such as the Tyson, the JBS kind of company, and consolidates different data sources to show which companies are disclosing information in their emissions and also setting targets for reduction. Uh, an essential methodology used by the private sector to disclose climate information and set reduction targets aligned with the Paris Agreement is the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is used to report company emissions and progress against targets on an annual basis. Unfortunately, FAIR has found that most of the largest protein producers in the world have not yet disclosed their emissions targets, and only a few of them have science-based targets. So what FAIR is doing is that we are unveiling which companies are doing their homework and which ones aren't so that investors who are the shareholders in these companies can use their influence to encourage companies to increase their disclosure and set science-based targets. Next slide, please. So it is, as I mentioned, about disclosure and transparency. And what we do is that we provide research and tools for investors to, be, uh, to have synthesized information and to distinguish which companies are leaders and laggards when it comes down to climate action, as well as other important ESG issues. So here you can see uh, some of the main tools that FAIR has to offer. Maybe I'll just flag one of them, which is the Protein Producer Index, which is a benchmark of the 60 largest listed uh, protein producing companies on ESG risk and performance, including climate-related KPIs. But we also have another risk that is specifically looking at uh, climate risk and the relevance for profit and earnings on companies, which is our climate risk tool. Next slide, please. So FAIR's approach is about assessing and engaging with food companies so that they increase their reporting and disclosure. This enables investors to undertake effective risk management and make informed decision which in turn stimulates further action from companies because investors as their shareholders have a tremendous influence on companies' behavior. Therefore, the more investors have the right information, the more they can reward the companies who are the leaders and also can put pressure on the laggards to do the more. The reality is that the private sector works uh, through clear incentives, so this approach is a very pragmatic one. Next slide, please. So, here, it's my, in my final slide, I just wanted to share a concrete example of what can be achieved through investor engagement. So since 2017, FAIR has been leading the investor support efforts for the Cerrado Manifesto, which is aimed at preventing deforestation in the Cerrado region of the Amazon, one of the world's most important biomes and sequesters of carbon. Through investor action, this statement has resulted in company action, 
with a group of very large and influential companies, including names such as Tesco, Walmart, and Nestle, now committing to halt deforestation in this area throughout their supply chains and also contributing to the funding coalition. So giving financial incentives to farmers so that they can transition towards soy that is produced exclusively on existing agricultural land to avoid further deforestation. So this is just one of many uh, examples that show that a lot can be done if we use investor influence as an incentive for livestock companies to mitigate climate impacts. I will stop here, but I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your feedback and questions. And I will now hand it over to Erin for a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sophia. And thank you to all of our speakers, Bola, Polly, Sophia, for your excellent presentations on livestock and climate smart agriculture innovation. Um, so now we're going to transition into a Q&A time. We've got about 15 minutes left before we wrap up for the day. So please um, continue submitting your questions in the Q&A box and we will pose them to our speakers. So I'm going to start off with a question um, for Polly. Um, so if, if all of our panelists could turn their cameras on, that would be wonderful. Um, and so Polly, as you talked about, there has been a lot of work done to quantify and verify emissions from livestock in developing countries. I think our colleague Noel dropped a link in the chat to a relevant publication um, about moving to tier two estimates of emissions from livestock. So as we think about the future and we look forward to a shifted focus on adaptation like you talked about, could you tell us more about where that shift has the potential for the greatest impact globally? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think in, in some ways, um, yeah, so, I think that the life, and I'm not alone in this opinion. I, I mean, um, others, uh, such as my colleague Philip Thornton, um, has written extensively on this. I think that um, it's been dangerous that the livestock sector has lagged behind the, the crop sector in, in terms of um, our, uh, in terms of um, the research um, that we've devoted to um, adapt, ad adapting to the risks of climate change. Livestock production is quite a bit more complicated than than, than crop-based production um, because it's we have animals that move around. Um, uh, it's yeah there it, we, there's all kinds of it's not just impacts on the food that they eat or the water that's available for them it's it, it's impacts on how they digest how much energy they have um can they can they deal with with heat stress um uh and then um often livestock are, are integrators um as bola said um in terms of, of nutrient cycling and systems and, and and we don't understand what 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 changes in, in climate will will bring to those kinds of nutrient cycles um so I think that um, the shift towards looking at adaptation will enable um, livestock production systems to to continue, um, and it will enable um, their it, their important role um, in 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 not just in integrated crop livestock systems, but in in um, uh, in, main, in maintaining um, uh, extensive um, production systems in, in dry lands, um, and and that enabling livestock-based livelihoods will will perhaps um, counterintuitively um, increase the incentives that that smallholder producers have to adopt um, practices that will contribute to mitigating um, the greenhouse gas emissions intensities from livestock because as, as both Bola and Rob said improving the productivity of, um, of livestock in low income and smallholder settings is actually the most climate smart thing that you can do so maintaining the productivity of livestock under a changing climate will actually contribute to reducing uh, emissions intensity. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for sharing that answer with us. Um, next, we're gonna go to a question for um, Bola um, from Bernard. So um, the work that you shared on supporting emission reduction has seemed to focus primarily on sedentary livestock systems where like diets and feed types are easy to manipulate. Could you talk a little bit more about what's being done in ruminant pastoral systems um, that are dominant in some uh, target parts of the globe? Thank you very much. Um, in our first five years, we did not focus on pastoral systems, and but we are doing that now. Um, now, some of the things that can be done to reduce emissions from pastoral systems, of course, pastoral systems are very diverse. 
You have those that are truly based on transhumans, those are based on agropastoralism, and some that have become sedentary. In Burkina Faso, I was with a woman uh, two days ago who um, uh, I was just so proud of in the sense that she, um, despite losing her husband and being a pastoralist, she now has 30 dairy cows and she's supplying milk to restaurants and hotels and so on. So when we talk about pastoralists, I think we need to understand the diversity of um, livelihoods represented. Uh, some of the things that could be done, Polly mentioned the importance of feed and of course water when you talk about transhuman pastoralists. Uh, these are critical needs. There's a lot of energy expenditure used for uh, transhumans. And um, there is a lot of, in most of Africa, uh, pastoralist animals experience a staircase growth pattern where there's growth during the rainy season and then in the dry season, there is either no growth or even a reduction um, where animals lose weight. So provision of adequate feed is very critical. And we've done some work in Burkina Faso to estimate the national feed balance. And we discovered, for instance, that although there's a surplus of feed supply for the entire country, um, in the Sahel regions, there's a big deficit, a uh, very significant deficit. So increasing feed production in those areas of the Sahel and uh, some of those areas where the pastoralists migrate away from in the dry season with drought tolerant forages, using silvopastoral systems, using some shrubs that can tolerate the dry con drought conditions would be very important strategies. Then also thinking about cost effective methods of bringing in feeds from areas where they can be readily produced, where drought conditions are not so severe, and making sure that we're not transporting water, but that we have conserved dry those feeds adequately and we're transporting them. Um, we had a project in Niger where we linked feed producers and um, small ruminant keepers who are 800 kilometers apart. And that re resulted in a tremendous increase in feed sales to those small producers, uh, improvement in the growth of their animals and a profit to smallholders. So these are just a few examples of things that can be done with pastoralists. Thank you. Great, thank you. Those are great examples. Um, okay, so I have a question for Sophia here. So um, would you talk briefly about, I'm sure that there are many, but some of the policy implications of, of the work that you shared? Yeah, thank you very much, Erin. So, there, there's substantial um, policy interlinkages, and we actually do have a policy work stream at FAIR where we're looking at kind of building bridges between the policy space and uh, the investment industry. But I guess, I mean, some of the obvious linkages has, have been seen over the last few weeks when we have all been following the discussions uh, at COP26 and where we're looking at uh, some of these discussions involving the transition of the private sector and the private sector asking for uh, an enabling environment that gives it a pathway to transition. And I think this is highly relevant for the animal agriculture sector, because uh, unlike other sectors, such as the energy sector, that have been given a clear pathway to transition and have been given kind of the enabling regulation to, to be motivated to transition and to kind of have a target of where they want to be in 2030 and in 2050, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done uh, for the animal agriculture space. And investors are asking policymakers to give them more of that enabling environment and to kind of give them some of that pathways that they need. So that's kind of a very obvious one. Uh, then I think again for another uh, kind of in, in immediate point of linkage is when we speak about nationally determined contributions that relate um, to, I mean, global greenhouse emissions, we are seeing that very few countries are actually reporting a specific sectoral targets when it comes to agriculture. So that's also the kind of the, the, the way that investors are now, and we have an investor statement that is encouraging uh, countries to actually uh, include that in their national determined contributions. So that's, again, a role that investors use their influence to ask policymakers to give them the right information to guide them and to also create the incentives so that investors and companies kind of have the right incentives to transition towards more sustainable practices. 
Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I think on this next one, we will start with Polly and then maybe see if anyone has anything to add. So um, organizations are, around the world are promoting a lot of climate smart technologies, but adoption can be a challenge. Um, and so Polly, do you have any thoughts or anything to share with us on sort of adoption of new practices, either for mitigation or adaptation and some of the mm -hmm. barriers um, that you see? Thank you. Sure, this is an area where we do quite a lot of research. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think, so on the on the mitigation side, if 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 we if we recognize um, uh, that that first statement that 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 Rob started out with, which is that improving the productivity of of, of livestock um, in smallholder and low income settings is um, will also reduce their greenhouse gas emission intensities. So if smallholder producers had figured out how to do this in a profitable way, they would have done it. Um, so uh, I think a a, a barrier to um, a barrier to broad scale uptake of, of climate smart practices is um, is that um, farmers don't necessarily um, see them as as profitable. Um, in the case of, of livestock and mixed crop systems, they often keep those livestock for for a variety of reasons. They're not always optimizing the productivity of livestock. They're using livestock to buffer against other kinds of stocks and stressors. They're keeping them as a as a savings account. Um, so I would say that we don't necessarily understand enough about um, the, the social and economic constraints um, that that smallholder producers are are facing um, to um, adopting practices that will in, initially reduce um, uh, the emissions intensities. Um, and so, um, to, to quote one of my my colleagues, uh, Birgit Haberman, we need to do much more starting where the producers are, and that becomes even more important when we switch to understanding what support farmers need to adapt their practices to, to climate change. So I know there's been a lot of work in the past uh, few years on providing climate information, helping farmers understand what the season ahead is gonna look like, um, but that, that information is quite limited if we don't, again, come to the context that producers are operating in and say, what, what, are, what are the, so climate is always a constraint in these smallholder rain-fed low-income systems, but what additional um, uh, incentives, what additional kinds of support um, do, uh, do producers need um, to be able to adapt um, uh, to both current climate risk as well as, as future an anticipated risk? Um, and so I think we need to do a better job of starting with, with producers and other value chain actors, so not only focusing on the producers, but looking at people who provide them with inputs and market opportunities. Um, to, to, to figure out what the context is before we start making recommendations about be, about behavior change. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. We have just a minute left. Bola, would you, or Sophia, would you like to add anything to that question? I think uh, Polly, you know, really answered that question well. That um, ensuring that, I think anything we do in development is participatory, is demand-led, is, is not top-down, is so vital and so critical and understanding that many times these technologies by themselves work, but that doesn't mean they will be adopted. And, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, have separate discussions with women to understand the, the gender nuances um, that will facilitate adoption. For instance, you know, a group of researchers introduced a forage chopper for women and they couldn't use it because it was too, um, the, the, the the energy needed to drive it, the manpower or woman power needed to drive it was excessive. So they had to tailor it to something that the women could work with. So I think the whole area of working with them and realizing that they have a lot to contribute is vital. And then working with whether it's sociologists, anthropologists, experts on behavior change is really, really vital. And then making sure that there is that enabling environment for policies and for institutional change, for providing the incentives that are needed for adoption. Thank you. Thank you, great addition. Sophia, I'd like to give you, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yes, and thank you. Uh, just one final point to mention on my side, which is related to the last question, but also um, to the question I was asked uh, and to the, this, this discussion in general, which is the importance of shifting agricultural subsidies to more sustainable and resilient production systems. Uh, because we have seen at COP, and I know that this is top of mind in investors' head, that there are 
more than 400 billion each year going to harmful agricultural subsidies, according to the UN, which do not support sustainable or resist, resilient uh, food system. So something that is of primary importance to this agenda. But thank you very much for all these interventions and for, for the insightful questions. Wonderful, thank you for that addition. Um, so uh, we're reaching the end of our time and I'd like to thank you all and all of our speakers, Rob Bertram, Polly Erickson, Bola Deshogan, and Sophia Condes for such a wonderful, rich session. And thank you all, our participants, for joining today. The webinar was recorded and you will get an email of the post-event resources as soon as they're available. And you can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they're ready. And I'd like to also thank my co-moderators, Kate Blanley and Mira Chandra, for helping make this event happen, as well as our KDLT colleagues, Shantice, Michael, and Elizabeth. So thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope you have a, a great rest of your evening, day. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.